Hey guys, it's Peter Fry, and welcome to the Living with Hope podcast, a weekly conversation where we dig into God's Word and explore what it means to live with hope in Jesus. I'm super excited for today's podcast because we have joining us via video David Geese, pastor of Village Church of Gurney, Illinois. Now, David, I, I, I hesitated there because how do you say it? Do you say Gurney or Gurney? Yeah, Gurney. That was one of the things early on that uh, our, my congregation helped coach me through, that it's not Gurney uh, in terms of the hospital kind of things, <laughs> but Gurney, yeah. So the syllables on this, uh, emphasis on the second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Uh, okay, so Gurney, Illinois. Uh, David, well, how you doing today, man? Good, 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 good. Uh, it's here in Illinois today. It's a warm day, and there's hope of spring. So yeah, we're we're doing well. Yeah, it is a glorious feeling. I've got short sleeves and shorts on. Uh, yesterday was my first day wearing shorts and it's like new life has been born in my heart and soul uh it's an exciting time of the year but i'm super excited to have david on the podcast david and i our friendship goes way back to when we met in undergrad and then we ended up going to the same seminary and david's been here on the podcast before and i'm super grateful for his friendship i think Sometimes God brings people into your life who help you think through life more clearly. And I think David, in our conversations together throughout the years, he's been one of those uh, sounding boards for me. And as I think about the podcast and this conversation about what it means to live with hope in Jesus, David's one who uh, lives with that hope and joy and is an amazing sounding board for me. So I hope this conversation can be helpful as we continue in our series in the book of Philippians. Uh, David and I are going to jump into Philippians chapter 2, verses 14 uh, through 18. I'm going to start out by reading that for us. Do all things without grumbling or questioning, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God, without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain." Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the uh, sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. David, when I was reading this, preparing for the podcast, I thought that verse 14 and then what follows in verse 15 was... Uh, kind of strange, honestly. It, it, this this command, do all things without grumbling or questioning. And then Paul, as he's writing that, puts a lot of weight on that. Uh, why do you think that is? Yeah, well, verse 14, I think, is one of those verses that is very easy to understand and instantly convicting to read. You know, do oh, yeah. things, all things without grumbling or disputing and um and over the past 12 months that has been quite convicting i think uh, the how easy it can be to either in our frustration or anxiety or fear uh, grumble and complain and and get into arguments and dispute um so i think you know it's one of those verses that none of us can wiggle out from under triumphantly. I mean, that's one that really hits all of us right to the core. And it is, it's striking that he ties this heart attitude or disposition to grumbling and disputing to our place as children of God. Um, So some of the things that come to mind in terms of that is this rich metaphor of us being God's children. 
that if we are saved by sheer and utter grace, um, it starts to melt um, grumbling and, and, and a complaining heart. Uh, because if it is true, what James says is true, and I, of course, we believe it is, that every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of lights, comes from God, uh, it gives us an incredible reason to be thankful and rejoice. And it helps kind of undercut that grumbling and disputing and complaining heart. Mm, that's so good. I, I, one of the things that I've observed as I read Paul's letters, and even here in this passage in Philippians, is how often it, I, I've described it like he sprinkles it like salt and pepper throughout his epistles, this phrase, with thanksgiving, yeah. and how often he is pointing us to this disposition of the Christian life of gratitude. And I think one of the things we see here in this connection between um, this somewhat simple and, like you said, convicting command, do everything without grumbling and disputing, and then he puts a lot of weight on what that d puts on display. He says, it, then you will shine as lights in the midst of a dark and crooked generation. And one of the things we see is that grace that you put that you pointed out this this identity as children of God grace leads to gratitude not grumbling and I think that that is a super um, convicting reminder because I, I find that it's easy to just fall into a pattern of grumbling whether it's about um, other people or situations that are out of my control um, but how do you think that grace and even this idea of the sovereignty of God and how does that point us to this attitude of gratitude rather than grumbling yeah well I think you know I love that these two verses talk about you know, do all things without grumbling or disputing that you might be blameless and innocent children of God. So I think there's an implied, there's an implied logic here that because we are children of God, our lives look differently uh, because we are connected to the light in Christ. His light starts to shine through us. And I think if we're children of God, we've only become by sheer grace. I mean, which one of us, chooses to be born into a family. I mean, that is all of utter and sheer grace from, from a loving parent or a heavenly father. Um, and I think if we're children of God, the God of the universe, the all-powerful, cosmic, all-knowing, uh, sovereign God and King, uh, it, I think it helps melt in our hearts this tendency and propensity to grasp for control. Mm. Um, we can't be backseat drivers to God's yeah. guidance in our life. And uh, when I think about, you know, if I'm um, riding in a car or riding in a bus or whatever, and, I, and I'm not at the driver's seat, um, not knowing where we're going or when the next gas station break will be or restroom break will be, I can start to grumble and complain because there's a measure of, I, I'm not in control. I'm not calling the shots. I'm not steering the car, the boat, the ship, whatever it might be. Um, but I think if we remember that God <laughs> is in control and he's guiding and he's directing, uh, that we can rest and that we can enjoy the ride instead of trying to control the ride or manipulate where he's going. And I think from that position of rest as his child, and not only just anyone's child, but the God of the universe, his children, uh, it lets us rest in what he has for us. That's so good. Man, I, I think of, as I was reading through this passage, I was thinking of the Israelites when they were led out of slavery. And this is, it's easy to kind of throw rocks at the Israelites in the Old Testament until I recognize, oh, wait, that's me. Like, <laughs> I do that. But they, they're led out of slavery. And then, you, you know, it's like the next chapter and they're grumbling, like, what are we going to eat? 
Like you let us out, you know, can't we just go back to, to slavery where we, where we had, uh, things to eat and, and God says, I will provide. And, and I think in, as I read the wilderness narratives, it's this story of God revealing who he is to his children and, and the kind of, um, subtitle of it all is trust me, trust me. And I think it, it, it just, I see myself, I, I grumble when, when my circumstances are in a place where I'm not in control. I, I grumble and my, that's like my natural, um, sinful tendency but when i focus like you said on god who is good and who is faithful when i focus on him and not my lack of control i start to rest in this confidence and the reality of grace and i think that as paul's writing this he points us to that he says in verse 16 holding fast to the word of life. So he's saying, do all things without grumbling and complain or disputing or questioning that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. So a result of our resting in this grace and having gratitude rather than grumbling is that we will inherently shine. That's an outcome. And then what ha- part of that process, though, he points us to is holding fast to the word of life. What, what do you think that, what, what is he talking about there? Uh, well, it's this beautiful, I think, mix of all these metaphors that we see both outside of Philippians and in Philippians is that um, the source of life is Christ, you know, the the living word capital w word is is jesus christ uh he is light uh he is uh, resurrection power and so i think all these things are wrapped up almost different facets of a diamond of describing who who jesus is that the if we're connected to him i love how you said that uh, one of the natural outcomes that we kind of can't help we kind of can't help i mean we can hinder it certainly in our own fallenness and brokenness and stubbornness and sin. But if the light is in us in Christ, it's gonna start shining through us. And I'm, I'm actually curious, um, Peter, what your thoughts are on, I think sometimes it can be easy for cynicism to kind of mask his wisdom. Right. Yeah. The reason I mention that is this passage talks about, you know, that we will shine as lights in the world, this idea that the world will be helped, the world will be benefited by the presence of, of Christians in, in your work spheres and social spheres and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but do you see that when, even as believers, where we can kind of Trojan horse our grumbling and disputing and it comes across as a little bit cynical and it, we can frame it as wisdom, but I don't know if that's helpful to the world i don't know if you have any thoughts on that yeah i think i think that we are in a place in our culture i think part of it is the um overload of information that all of us are bombarded with every day um as one person put it we're um overexposed and underdeveloped and the result of that is that everybody's an expert on anything and it's just the age of social media and the internet and your news feed and all of a sudden it has become an acceptable practice to be a critic and to um even, I, you know, sometimes I, I see it happen in my own heart. And so I, I'm like speaking out of like, Lord, help me in this. Because it's easy to look at people who maybe I disagree with, whether it's politically or um, even within the church, like how we go about um, even approaching the season of COVID and 
um, there's a lot of differences of opinion. And I hear the words of Paul here, do everything without grumbling and disputing. And I start to think, you know what, that's not so strange of a command. Because this is, um, I think it's the disposition of of self-centeredness. And, and in the context here is um, Paul is talking about humility and pointing to Christ as the ultimate example of humility who, who didn't consider his own interest, but, but our interests. And he stepped into our broken world, uh, not with a disposition of, you guys really messed up here, but a disposition of forgiveness and grace. And I just think that part of this holding fast to the word of life is allowing ourselves to not look to the acceptable practices of culture as our guide for how to respond to the events of today, but to look to Jesus and how did he respond and follow in his footsteps. I love that because I think the, you know, the times that I've, uh, encountered many times that I've encountered, you know, believers who were more spiritually mature than me. I, I sensed simultaneously this um, hopeful optimism, not kind of a, uh, a pearl's head in its shell kind of optimism or ostrich's head in the sand kind of optimism, but a hopeful optimism, yet at the same time, a very sober appreciation and grasp of the brokenness of this world. And I, I, I love what you said, Peter, because I think it reminds me of in this passage when it talks about the day of Christ, you know, that ultimately, of course, Christ has come in Philippians. We see this beautiful example of a selfless heart that's humble and seeking to serve others, and ultimately an example of Christ and this fresh reminder that he's coming back. And um, I love this idea of the day of Christ, even right out of this passage, because I think it it gives us a sense of optimism uh, that as believers, there really never is theologically a place for us to totally give way to despair. Do we get discouraged? Absolutely. Do we have bad days? Absolutely. I mean, Jesus uh, shed tears of blood. I mean, the Christian life can be hard, but I think this idea that Christ is coming back is kind of a guard from utter despair. But the fact that he's not back yet, um, I think also safeguards us from kind of an optimism that's unaware of the challenges of the world. But I think both of these boundaries um, really help position us, to, as you're saying, to selflessly pour out ourselves for others in the world that were shining like this light uh, in a very balanced way. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah. Yeah, one of, uh, actually, it was uh, quite a bit ago on the podcast, I was walking through Romans 8, and so looking at this idea of groaning that we see in Romans 8, that is kind of our response to the brokenness of the world, and we groan, and how that is a good disposition to have, but groaning without hope leads to grumbling. Um, but but groaning with hope leads to this hopeful optimism in this place of, um, we talked about this earlier, like kind of releasing our, our grip on um, the, the present circumstances. And we start to see how our future hope uh, changes our present reality, even if our circumstances don't change. And what what an example of that is the book of Philippians, because Paul's writing this under house arrest, saying, I, I, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. And, and his eyes are off of his circumstances. And, and, and you just see this joy uh, just emitting from the pages of Philippians and I, I, I think of that here where he says, do, do nothing out of grumbling or disputing. And I think, man, if anybody was in a position to grumble, it's the Apostle Paul here as he's writing this. 
And um, I think I think it gives us um, not a set of rose-colored glasses that see starts to see positive in every circumstances, but a, a pair of grace-colored glasses where we start to see how God um, is at work in the midst of circumstances where we we can't even we can't even know how in the intricacies of that. Um, but even in the midst of, as Paul describes, a, a, a crooked um, generation, a, a dark, dark world, in the midst of a dark, dark world, we can shine as lights as we let the word of life be our source of light in the world. And I think that that makes, that makes all the difference in that disposition of, um, like we were saying, uh, groaning with hope rather than groaning with grumbling. I think you said something really important to, in terms of, you know, our relationship to our circumstances. You know, even in this passage, I love that, I mean, Paul's, again, he's writing from house arrest and he's saying things like in 17 and 18, I'm glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. Like, mm. the, you wouldn't expect these words coming from someone in house arrest. And I think, just like you said, Peter, I think it's an indicator that he's got a source of hope and light that is not tethered to his circumstances. And I think going back to um, holding fast to the source of our light, holding fast to our identity, first and foremost, as children of God, that if we have a source of hope outside of our circumstances outside of this world, uh, this crooked and, and depraved generation, it gives us uh, the resources to actually do that, to actually be able to not grumble and dispute. And I, I wonder, that's where I think um, we as Christians have perhaps a greater opportunity for witness, maybe more than we know. Um, mm -hmm. How many times have I been in a conversation that has started to kind of slip into grumbling or, or complaining yeah. that I kind of joined in with it instead of, and again, not kind of in a, I like that rose colored glass kind of optimism that's not aware of our circumstances, but to gently and graciously remind people, whether they're believers or unbelievers, that there is a source of hope that's not tied to our circumstances, and that can give us the ability to, to not grumble or, or, or dispute, but to be, to be glad and rejoice. So good. So I, I want to get real practical as we wrap this up. Um, let's say I'm a pretty, I wouldn't consider myself a, a cynical person, um, but there can be circumstances of life and maybe somebody listening would say, you know what, I feel cynical. I feel like my natural response is to grumble. What would you say um, is a path toward um, this disposition of gratitude and grace rather than grumbling? Yeah, I think maybe two things. I think if we find in our hearts kind of a growing cynicism that either we start to be aware of or we realize, oh my gosh, it's so deeply ingrained, I don't even know the way forward. I think maybe two things come to mind. I think number one, we have to really take a good hard look at our Father, at, at God, His power. And then I think we need to take a really good hard look at our future. Uh, that the entire story of the Bible paints a future with a good ending, yeah. one that um, good does triumph over, over evil and light does triumph over darkness. And I think the more we saturate our minds in those ideas that if the future ultimately is a hopeful one, and if our God, our Father, ultimately is a powerful one, uh, it starts to melt this idea in my heart that the future's gray um, or there's no hope that I have that I have in my father. And I think yeah. to the extent that those are soul realities in our life, I think it'll be harder and harder and harder for, for cynicism or grumbling or disputing to get a foothold in our life. 
I think that's so good. And I think Paul gives us a real practical um, picture here. Hold fast to the word of life. Mm-hmm. And we have his word that um, I just picture. Like, I'm, I have this uh, really literal picture of like, how do I hold fast to this? And, um, I mean, I think that that this is, again, um, we talk about this a lot on the podcast, that living with hope in Jesus is staying connected to the source of that hope. And and we do that in this word. And I just think the more, like like we pointed to earlier in the podcast, the more I I read the scriptures and I, I see the experience of Israel in the wilderness, grumbling, uh, against God and, and God saying, I'm the one who led you out of Egypt. And I think this takes us back to that, that reminder that I'm the one who adopted you as a child. And, and I, before the world was even established, I set my love upon you to be adopted as children according to the purpose of his will and not ours. And the more I tether myself to that reality, I think the more, like you said, cynicism will melt in our hearts and our hearts will grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus. And we say it here often, but hope in Jesus changes everything. And I think we see in this passage that hope in Jesus changes our disposition to circumstances that would naturally make us grumble. And so David and I were joking before we started recording this co- podcast. David, what'd you say? Like you're starting to, to see people people's dispositions changing with the weather? Yeah, so here in Illinois, and I, I grew up in Northern Minnesota. So whenever the weather, you know, just cracks over the 60 degree mark, you know, and higher, the sun starts to shine. It feels like the fruits of the spirit come back, you know. And, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we always teasing both with Peter and and others, you know, that you know what there is hope in this world. <laughs> and <laughs> certainly, this passage shows us we have a much more stable hope than the weather, <laughs> which is oh. a good news. <laughs> Amen, brother. Amen. <laughs> <laughs>